This video looks at the idea of null tetrads and how they can be used to determine the form of the Kerr metric, which describes the space-time outside a rotating mass. It makes use of the Newman-Janus method by starting with the Schwarzschild metric in advanced Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates, and then performs a series of transformations to produce the Kerr metric. So in general relativity, a tetrad or veer beam is a set of four orthonormal vector fields with one time-like and the other three space-like that are defined on a Lorentzian manifold in order to model space-time. Think of the Lorentz transformation and locally the speed of light um, being C and the light cones being uh, upright and um, in their usual form, so Lorentzian in that sense. A tetrad is also a frame field, and tetrads are geometric objects that are independent of the coordinates used. So another useful point, because physics should be independent of the coordinates used. Now, <clears throat> tetrads are built from vectors that describe the movement of light in some given direction. And these vectors are null, meaning their magnitude under the scalar product is zero, and represent the local light cone at each event in space-time. Tetrads represent the local structure of space-time light cone. All right, so you can imagine a congruence of time-like geodesics that covers space-time with time-like four vectors, such as the four velocity here, uh, of some observer being tangent to these geodesics. So these geodesics form a congruence in the sense that there's, uh, through each point, there's only one geodesic passing through it. Um, and every point has a geodesic passing through it. You can see that the lines uh, thread, if you like, through the, through the manifold. And the let's say take the four velocity here of some observer. It's tangent to these geodesics. And um, these geodesics form the possible world lines of this observer. And the observer is freely falling, meaning that he, she is following or responding to the local curvature of space-time. So they're, they're freely falling in that sense. They're moving with it. You can imagine, uh, to picture that, you could imagine the observer, the particle, the laboratory, released from rest some distance from our rotating mass here and allowed to freely fall according to the curvature of the space-time around the rotating mass. So that's how you picture it. All right, now each event, P, on these world lines has a spatial triad associated with it that these observers carry with them. And the time-like component is taken to be the four-velocity observer. So the time-like component is taken to be the four-velocity of the observer on this world line. Here is tangent to the and we'll find that, um, notice that the time-like component of the tangent of the tetrad, sorry, is tangent to the observer's world line in the following diagram. So here we are. All right. Time-like component of the tetrad, the four velocity taken to be the four velocity of the observer is this time-like component, which is tangent to the world line of the observer. And then we have these spatial axes which we'll have a look at in a moment all right now the three space light vectors can then be thought of as defining the spatial coordinate axes of a local laboratory frame carried along with these observers so e1 e2 e3 forming the spatial axes of uh, of the laboratory that's freely falling in this space time so an observer in space time can be thought of as contained within a small laboratory that moves along a time light world line for me, for the signature, the metric that I use on these videos, ds squared is less than zero in that case. Now, the observations are made with respect to the axes and the clock of the laboratory as they form an orthonormal basis in which the observer is at rest. So the observer is at rest with respect, he or she at rest with respect to the axes of the laboratory. And these axes are the spatial axes that form of our tetrad. All right, so we can use the Newman-Janus method, which utilizes null tetrads to, de to determine the form of the Kerr metric. So we're seeking tetrads of this form, E0, 1, 2, 3. And we're going to call them L, N, M, N, M bar as you in the literature, M conjugate. Now in component forms, the components are these. You'll see that in the literature. 
and the Schwarzschild line element in advanced Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. So we'll start with this is call this our seed uh, line element or seed metric if we just look at the metric part. Um, we have this here, uh, Schwarzschild element in advanced Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. Now we found in a previous video on null tetrads. Um, if you look for that uh, that video on null tetrads, you'll see that we came up with these relationships here for the metric, for the lowered indices and the inverse metric for the all indices upper. And we found that in terms of the components of our tetrad, each of these metric terms is found in the following way. Right, so first we need to find our tetras, and if you go back to that video, the process for finding these was shown, um, all the steps involved, how uh, these uh, components for the tetrad were produced, both the covariant form and the contravariant form were found. Now as part of the Newman-Janus method, we need to allow the first two vectors in our tetrad to take on complex values while remaining real. So the first step is to take these tetrads here, and what we're going to do is allow them to take on complex form, but from which we want to extract the real part, because we are dealing with physics, we're dealing with real quantities, um, so we want to keep these real, right? Now the last two, uh, that's the M alpha and the M alpha bar, will remain complex conjugates of each other, but we want to allow the first two parts, whether it be the lowered, L alpha, N alpha, or the contravariant ones to take on complex values. So let's have a look at how we do that. All right, so let's look at a complex number Z is X plus I, Y. And the real part, real part of Z is X part here. And we can do that by achieving that by taking the complex number and adding to it the complex conjugate. So Z plus Z bar, all right? And when we do that, the imaginary parts cancel out. And then if we multiply, then we're left with the two real parts, divide by two, add them and divide by two, we, we, we get the original value x, the real part of z here. In the case of reciprocal term, how do we find the real part of one on z? Well, let's just try one over two times one over z plus one over z bar. When we do that, and we work out the denominator here, we end up with x squared plus y squared. And with the numerator, we end up with two x. And if we do that, we end up with the real part of z over modulus of z squared. And so all of this is real. So when we extract the real part of this, we end up with a quantity here that is real. So a tetrad with covariant indices now looks like the following. Uh, there's no uh, r value. And this was constant, so nothing happened here. But here... We have this one on R plus one on the conjugate of R because we've allowed R to become complex. Now altogether, this still will extract for us a real value, which is what we need because we're dealing with real quantities. All right. um, and so just rewriting that, this two and this two will cancel. So we end up with this object here. We still have now for the complex part, M alpha, we still have this and the conjugate part is so on. Okay, our next step now to head towards the Kerr metric. Turns out we need to make the following coordinate transformations. U to uh, U dash, remember the advanced time parameter in the Schwarzschild metric was in advanced Eddington Finkelstein coordinates was U. And so U dash will now replace that with U plus this complex part here, I times A cos theta. Remember A was the angular momentum per unit mass. And R will similarly replace with R prime, which will be R plus I A cos theta. And the angular part will remain the same. That won't change. It's just the U and the R that undergo uh, transformation. Why? Because it works, uh, as you'll see shortly. All right, so let's come back to our complex, uh, let's come back to our tetrads again. Here we are, L alpha, covariant uh, index alpha, N alpha, this object here. We've substituted in the R plus IA cos theta, and similarly over here, the conjugate. Uh, calculate, work that through, and we end up with this object here. Now, let's look at the other two complex uh, tetrad vec uh, components, components of the tetrad vectors. Remember, these are all our basis vectors. Uh, and uh, substitute that in here, and in here as well. When we work that through, end up with this object and this one. Now, what we, this one is 
once we've established this, all we need to do is to take the conjugate of this, this object here, and this will work out to, uh, to produce the correct result later on. So just taking the conjugate of this, this becomes minus, same over here, some changes here, um, and ready for the next page. Now we can generate the terms of the metric G alpha beta using our new tetrad and from that previous video on null vectors and tetrads uh, we found this relationship. Now let's use this relationship. We're going to find G U U. Um, remember from our um, Schwarzschild uh, metric in advanced Eddington Finkelstein coordinates we had G U U um, and to find that we now substitute in here L U which was the one, NU was this object here, minus NU, which uh, again this object here, LU was times one, so here's our one here. These were zero for those components. The U components of the M and the M bar were zero, left us with that. And we worked this through, uh, minus, minus, uh, <clears throat> that's a half, that's a half. When we add together, we get a whole, so it's this object here. The next uh, element in our line element was the cross term UR and calculating through that again the MU and MR disappeared at the end to give us zero, MUs were zero as we saw above. When we work our way through this LU uh, and NR was negative one, uh, working out through here we end up with this object here that was times zero here, LR was zero, that disappeared so fortunately we're left with just plus one. Next step was the theta theta term, calculating through here. Again, same thing if you go back to what we found earlier for our tetrads, n theta, l theta um, disappeared to give us zeros, and we only had the now the m theta and the m theta conjugate come into play. That gives us these object working the algebra through gives us this phi phi term. Same thing here again, l phi n phi are all zero, so that all disappeared. That left us with this object here. Uh, plus this, remember the conjugate part is this bit, this bit here. Uh, when we work it through the algebra, we end up with this object here. Next step. All right, now our transformations are, we've used this and this, and so that means the differentials then take the form du prime is this, this, and this. You will notice sometimes, I'll just come back here to the moment of our transformation, Sometimes in the literature, you're going to find that it's a plus here and a plus here. Um, I found here that if you use minus, minus with the signature, the metric I've used and so on, if you use the minuses here, it will work. Our differentials then become this object here and this one here. The angular differentials don't change. They're the same under this transformation. And our line element now takes the form. Here we are, ds squared is this object, that one. Let's now substitute in what we found on the previous slides, gives us this, but du squared becomes du plus ia sine theta d theta, all squared, um, plus two times this object times this one, plus this one, and plus that one. All right, next step, we're going to now, we can't just leave the imaginary number i there, that's not going to help us but it will turn out that we're going to make the unusual transformation that i times d theta is equal to sine theta d phi. Now, looking around in the literature, I've seen claims that this result is not provable, that um, it's just a transformation that's used because it works. Um, if someone can prove it, great. Add it, show the proof in the comment section below this video, by all means, but uh, it would be interesting to see that. And prove it in the general case, not just for incremental angles, but if you can prove it in general, that would be something useful. But from what I've seen in the literature, there's no claim that this is provable. But it is a result that works. So let's see how it works. So remember we had our, um, before we had our i a sine theta d theta. So what I've done here is just to put the i and the d theta together in each of these terms. And when we do that here, if we then replace i d theta, i d theta, i d theta, if we then replace that with sine theta d phi, that becomes a sine squared theta d phi. This becomes a sine squared theta d phi, similarly here, okay? 
Our next step now, all right, is um, bingo, finished. <laughs> We've achieved the Kerr metric in the form that he published in his original 1963 paper, a snapshot of which I've got here. Uh, here's the original form. He's used natural units, G and C equal set to one, um, whereas I've included them here, G and C. Um, but other than that, uh, the same result. So this is what he, this is the form of the Kerr metric that he published in his 1963 paper originally. And here's how you get it. And here's where the step and these were the steps that we've used. All right, that's.